I'm Edwin Boss Okuyu and um, I, am, I do marketing and branding and I'm a husband of one wife, my wife Cynthia Marebe. I think she'll introduce herself. Okay, uh, my name is Cynthia Marebe. I am Edwin's wife and a mother of two kids. So I had gone to speak in the, um, somewhere in Madari and he was part of the, the audience. And I think a few days later, I got his friend request on Facebook. And I was like, oh, okay, I saw him, I know him, he's familiar, I accepted. And then started liking his post, you know, like that. And then he was looking for, um, I bumped into him one day, I was looking for somebody to employ for a role I was doing myself when I started the company, when I joined the company. So I was looking for somebody to give that job. So we bumped at Nakumat Lifestyle. He had gone to buy a book, I had gone to buy envelopes. So when we bumped into each other, it was like, oh, you, where have you been? I'm looking for somebody who can take up a role in the company. Do you think you can do it? And that role was to be somebody who will do deliveries, like an errand person. And then so he accepted and immediately we went to the office. I gave him his new job and now I became his boss and we're working together. <laughs> yeah, so we were working. And then, did you, hit a, did you hit on me or what happened? He, I remember the day when he was hitting on me. I laughed, I laughed hysterically and I said, you are a joke, you're joking. There's no way I can be your girlfriend. We are friends, you know, we are, we are silly friends. I can't be your girlfriend. And for me, I actually, at some point when I went home and thought about it, I was like, this guy just wants to use me. He thinks I'm like all the other girls in his life. And so I felt kind of bad and I told him, don't ever tell me that you want me to be your girlfriend again. <laughs> hey, she's a tough woman. One of the things that uh, she's not an easy woman. So many can, people can testify to this. Uh, she's not an, uh, uh, somebody that um, you need to have the capacity to handle her. Because if you don't have that capacity, you cannot handle that. One of the things that it was really hard for me, probably I can say, it was just how, how to really convince her into something, because you really need to have that wisdom to tell her, let's go and do this. Uh, but one thing I really, like I said previously, um, one thing that really um, I really knew, that I need to really concentrate on the things that she likes. Once I, I concentrate on that, these other aspects would be very simple for me. And uh, one of the challenges was just me probably taking her out and she was really coming from, she had a past in a relationship. So one of the things that was really hard is just trying to get her healed in a previous relationship, to, to take her out, to show a new way how, how we can make this relationship work. There are some challenges here and there, but um, I think one of the main challenges on my side was just to convince her that I'm, I'm, I'm really into this, I'm, 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 I, I really want to marry you, I don't just want to date you. I don't want to be like the team of easy, let me, let me say that. Because I used to tell her I will take you into an aisle one day. And she was really laughing, thinking I'm just here to play with her. Yeah, I think she, she, used, to think, she used to think like I was a, I was a joker. But, uh, yeah, yeah I actually, yeah, yeah, I used to think he's a joke. Because he too has a past, he has a past with women and I knew about it because we were friends and we'd go out together, he'd tell me, oh, I went to a party, this girl, this guy, and I'm like, have one girl at a time if you must. And then here's the guy I'm advising on not, what not to do with women and now he's hitting on me. It was an offense at the first time, but uh, like I said, it was really hard for him to convince me. Anytime he'd bring up the subject of us dating, and uh, the time where it was really, I was not for it. Uh, and so, and I was also, I was wearing the auto repel for men. You see me, I'm repellent, you can't come any near. And so here he's also trying to pass through that wall. It was not easy, it was, it was a challenge, yeah. Aha, uh -huh, courtship. So we started dating eventually. The major challenge was that I was his boss when we were dating. And so it was very hard for me to ask him to do anything. It was very hard for me to, ask, to give him a task because now I am his boss. I'm supposed to be submissive to my boyfriend. It was very difficult. 
and then when we want to have a date over lunch hour in the office, he first leaves and then he sends me a text message, you can now come. So there were, there were challenges, it looked like we were having an office romance, we have to hide the relationship from our colleagues. So the only time we either wait for everybody else to leave the office and then we leave and walk home together. It used to be so difficult to date because we are seeing each other every day unless on Sundays, so he started coming to my church now on Sundays so that we can at least have an easy time being ourselves. Yeah, so for me that would be the challenges during courtship. And just to make it clear, she's not my boss. Anymore, mm. okay. Yeah, so probably the viewers can see and think she's my boss. She's not my boss. At that point, I was also being, in, I was being mentored and um, I really had a vision to start my own thing, to start my own company. I needed to... Um, because one thing that I really appreciate even for my mentor, what he did to me, he really showed me a new way of life. And uh, when I met, I knew that if I have this room, I need to have something that I need to present. So during the coach period, it was all about knowing each other. It was all about me sharing my vision to her, telling her that I'm, this is what I'm planning for us to be in the next five years, in the next two years. So I, I can say, and really our spiritual mother, Pasatayo, she has really played a lot in our courtship because she's the one who really used to, there's a time you want to give up, you say, ah, I'm done with this. But she really used to be there for us and just telling us that now it's, this is the way. Because if you don't rough up, if you don't get into places where you're arguing, she used to tell us that now you're knowing each other. Because if it's all about glam, you're laughing every time. Uh, but the moment we used to go through that, those rough moments, our mentor was there, Pasatayo, telling us, this is how you need to do it, this is how you need to do it. But she used to tell us, you need to communicate. Communication is the best key. So, and it really helped us also in our marriage, with the communication part. So I can say in a nutshell, um, there's the courtship period, what really uh, made us to be here where we are. It's just the, the mentorship part from our spiritual parents. Yes, I can say from my past, I've been, I've been a life whereby I'm not scared to do anything new. I, when I see a challenge, I always face it head on, whether I'm prepared or not, I always face it. And uh, also, and also to women, I was not scared of women, I can say that. But for her, it was really tough, because I used to, I, I was coming from a slum. We are used to the, the girls in the slum, but right now we are getting somebody with a different perspective, somebody who's a, who's a head, head, head of department, and she's leading people in that department, and you're also part of those people that you, she's leading you. So, and um, I, I can say, it's the mentorship that did the, uh, a little part of it, but also uh, I am, I'm that person I really like to face my challenges. What I can also say for, for him also, he, he upped his game. He, he had to up his game. Like, you know, he no longer ha be, was behaving like um, somebody who's from the slum. His conversation was mature. I think he had studied me like a book and he knew exactly when and when not to. So he upped his game, his dressing changed, you know, he'd come, he's wearing rubbers, and I'm thinking, no, not for me right now. But then he upped his game, and by the time I was even saying yes to him, he was sort of, you wouldn't say I was the boss, yeah. Do you want to hear about the wedding? The wedding is a long story. Because, um, one of the things, the reason why we didn't have all this is the wedding, it happened whereby people were really promising a lot of things. Somebody tells you, this day I'm going to bring you five cars. <laughs> tomorrow somebody calls you and says, tomorrow I'm going to give you five chips or I'm going to produce this. Now let us come to the day of the wedding. When we come to the day of the wedding, Everyone who promised the things that they said that they are going to, to, to deliver, we didn't receive. It was only... I think only like five people. It was, only five, it was five to three people who came, who came around and they delivered. But we really thank our friends. We really thank our friends. We had good friends who were there with us. We had um, also our spiritual parents who were also there with us. We can also thank our family members and who are really there for us because that day was really hectic. We are waking up in the morning and the first thing you are being told, Gari Aikuji. It was Gari Amesema, the person who said that we'll cut off the car is not there anymore. 
when you try to call him that morning around 6.30, he's not picking. And you're the only person who has the contacts. So I'm like, it's a gari yakuji. Then the caterer says, I have not been finished. My, my payment has not, I have not been paid the whole amount, so I'm not coming. So I had to call all of these guys and tell them, hey, listen guys, this is not the day for you to tell me you're not coming. He said that you come, I have to write post-dated checks, just tell them, come, I'll write a check for you, just because you can't let me down for this day. Um, that was really the most challenging part, just all the suppliers coming up and telling me we're not coming. I think for me, I always say I'll write a book and call it the drama of my wedding. You see, before that, I, I never used to fancy wedding, I never used to be, oh, my wedding will be like this, I never used to be the wedding kind of a girl. And so I learned something that it is better you have a dream of how you want your wedding to be because if you don't have anything, it's fine. So that is typically what happened for us on our wedding day. I, I remember that morning, in fact, I slept at 1, I, 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 2 a.m. in the morning. We were calling the venue. They had told us we can use their kitchen for our catering. Then they are telling us we can no longer use the kitchen. So the last minute we are looking for a kitchen. Then uh, the person who's supposed to get my car calls and says uh, he has a, he did not remember that he was something he was supposed to do in his school and so he cannot he can no longer bring the car and then there were too many things i remember the caterers because we had we had wanted our we had our own menu and how we wanted it to be done so the guys who were cooking in the wedding they cooked from the house where i was coming from and then like he said we had we had, we, had, we had gotten promises from friends, oh, we'll do, we'll bring, you know, the way people promise you before the wedding. Hey, okay, wait until that day. A lot of things just went wrong. The venue went wrong, the cars went wrong. The only thing that was perfect was the two of us, that I was getting married to the man I had wanted to marry, was the food at the wedding and was the people there. But every other nitty I remember in the evening of the wedding, there were no lights. So the last part of the wedding, we had to really, really rush things because the venue switched off the lights and they did not tell us, you know, it was too much. I always tell write a drama about my wedding, but that's a story for another day. But the wedding by itself, it was hectic. My advice would be, work with what is in your pocket. If whatever is in your pocket cannot cater, go to the AG, get married, have a small ceremony, but work with what is in your and pocket. And at times, probably somebody can tell you, you know, let's say ladies or even us, we normally want, we are, like right now, the, the face that we are in, we ask millennials that we, we are being moved by technology where you see other people are doing big weddings. And we're also in a position, somebody can tell you, do you have a wedding which is within your budget? And you're like, ah, no, I want to do this. My, my friend said he'll provide this. My uncle said he'll give me this. My, what I can advise uh, my fellow uh, people who are trying to get married out there, just work with what. If it's 20,000, mm, work with 20,000. 20, if, if, if guys promise that they'll bring, let those be extras. Yeah. Something that if it was a car that somebody promised they'll give it, let that car carry your friends or carry other, any other person. But what I can advise, work with what you have. Yes. The most important thing, like I even told her that I, I don't want to, to make this be a big wedding, but after 20 years, we can sit down and arrange a wedding because we have something to celebrate on at that moment. But right now, we don't want to spend five million on a wedding. Then after two or three years down the line, we are coming back to regret on about the things that we, we didn't do right. Yes, so what I can say on my wedding, the things that I didn't learn, if I had a chance probably to, to tell someone what to do, just work within your budget. Yeah. Yeah. Work with what the two of you have. Anything else is a plus. We have two kids, Bobo and Kesha. <laughs> Bobo is a nickname. Uh, yeah, Bobo and Kesha. The kids, yes, they did have an impact. For me, first of all, was that my, my, my everything just shifted. You know, attention when it comes to him. Now, every I was dedicating most of the time for the kids. And then, uh, 
for him, another thing that I saw happening with him was that his clock changed because we'd sleep late, soothing the baby, you know, he's crying, too. so he sleeps for one hour, we take turns. I sleep for one hour, we are taking turns. So by the time the kid now has grown up, we are now, his clock has changed. I used to be a night person, I work very well at night, I can go up to 2 a.m. And he used to be a morning person, he wakes up at 4 a.m. and goes throughout the rest of the day. But now by the time we're done, his clock had shifted. He's now a night person up until today. When the kids, I think basically would be the attention bit of it. Attention, they require attention, the needs now, as in motherhood, just everything that comes with a new person. Yeah, I, I don't know for him. For me, for me, it really changed my work because um, I had clients who they need you in the office by 6 a.m. and you have a child, you just had a child, they, as we know parents who are up there, they, they cry the whole night, you have to sleep around 4 or 5, then 5 you are out again. And it was really challenging at first, but I came to adopt you know, the, the, the good thing is that I'm self-employed and I started my so it was really challenging at first. But it really changed my calendar. Right now I normally work at night. I can work up to around 6 a.m. Because of my kids and also I have to create time for them. Because my, I, I come from a life where it was just me. I can work up to around 3 a.m. I can go and meet my friends and just do myself. But when the kids came into my life and now, now this, uh, it was a big change for me because I was really trying to adopt into so many things. And I really had to also, in part of my vision, and anything to do with my company, I had to rearrange everything. And because um, now it's not all about me, it's about my children and my wife. So I had to do a lot of changes in my life in regards to my company and also to my, my family. And then another thing would be spending time at home. You know, previously you'd be okay, you come late, you leave early. But at this point now, you leave the house and um, Kesha is saying, Mom, please come back early, you know, so everything just changes. And then you have, can we do movie night? You think, is it really necessary? So the kids have their own needs that you have to give them attention, you have to give them time. They go to school, they see other kids, they have this, they have that, they come home, they want the same. So you have to also do a lot of talking to them, a lot of... Um, inspiring them, making them believe in themselves. You know, a lot of time, again, being given to the kids is a major thing. So for me, even at work, I have an extra work, I have flexible working days because I have to go home early for the kids. I have to go home early for my husband again. So a lot of things just shift. Like our boy, Bobo is very, very playful. And uh, he does some things and we see like, e, there is a genius, you know. So again, another thing that we are learning when we are bringing them up is let the kids be, let them be. You know, a lot of parents say, oh, how can I control this boy? He's too playful. How can I suppress? You know, but just let him be because we notice sometimes when we stop him from doing something, he'd feel, very, he'd feel like you have put him in a cocoon again, you know. And then uh, for Kesha, who's the big one, we learn a lot from her. Like uh, the other day when I, 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 they, they had a school camp and I took her to school and her teacher called me aside and he said, ah, do you know that Kesha is the, um, is the commander of the scout? And she's a young girl and I'm like, wow, interesting. Yes, I knew, but she kept telling, mom, you know, I'm the school commander of scout. And I'm like, oh yeah, right, fine. I did not like take it seriously. But when the teacher told me, I was like, wow, you mean she really is? And then um, the teacher also said, your daughter, She's very play, uh, playful. She brings other kids together when there's conflict. You see, she's the one who is intermediating, and that's how she got into the leadership of the scout command, uh, as the scout commander. And she's only in class four, so it made me realize that you see this all playful thing. She has been learning from her father probably, yeah, because anytime she'd wake up in the morning to go to school when her bus is coming, she'd hear him pray. You just hear him praying and praying and praying and then before she goes to school she comes and places her head so that she can be prayed for so you know we learn that it regardless of what you say what you do is what the kids will pick because no matter how we tell them pray before you eat pray when you go to school do this do this everything that our kids are becoming are the things they have seen us doing at home
So that for me is the major thing I have learned from the kids, that they really do a lot of what you do and regardless of what you say, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, for me also, the, I can say I've really learned from them because uh, like um, there's this day probably I had a lot of pressure and um, and then like Kesha, she came to me and said she needed to go to, uh, she needed to go, there's something they needed to, to pay in school. And she was cool, she knew that I will give it to her. And at, at that point I'm also thinking there's something, I'm, I'm having a pressure in the office, there's some things I need to, uh, to do. But for her, she knew that my, my, my dad is going to do this. And it really got into me, because I normally learn a lot from her and also from my son. And I was looking, um, as I was reading the Bible, it's also telling me, I'm, I'm thinking if my daughter is in this position, know that I can deliver. What about God? So I really learned a lot from them through God also. And also for my son, at times when we normally um, worship, he, he's normally there looking at us. So at, at times when he, he's, right now he's one year, one year, yeah, one, month. one year, one month. So when he, when he hears a worship, he'll start lifting his hand Turn up. <laughs> Sometimes even you don't want to worship, but when you see him lifting his hands up, up, you know, oh, okay, it's time to worship. Or he can just wake up and start lifting his That's hands. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> just tell me, okay, it's time to worship. So it really teaches me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And also for another thing would be the, the faith aspect of it, because with Kesha, when we are telling her when she needs something, we have taught her to believe for herself. So like that time when they were going for a camp, uh, we, ha we were supposed to pay, of course, some money. Then I told her, Kesha, you need to use your faith to get that money. Then she said, okay, if I don't have to deal with you and I have to talk to God, I know it will come. So you just wait. You know, my trip is sorted. So the faith aspect, and you know, when you look at them, they are not worried. And that's how God wants us to be, that we are not worried about it. Once you've told him, it is sorted. So sometimes when I'm, I'm starting to get agitated about things that I'm believing God for, I remember how my kids are with me. That once they say it is done, it is done. Okay, to parents, uh -huh. like I said earlier, let the kid be. Because if you do not let your kids express themselves, you're raising criminals. One way or another, they'll find a way to express themselves. That is how come some kids when you go to school, you are hearing a different report from what you know at home, you know. So when you make your children be your best friends, they are able to tell you what they think, when and how. You are able to read their thoughts, yeah? You know, like, um, there's something that happened the other day and the parents of that boy were saying, the boy was fine last night, we didn't know that he was, he was about to do it. It's this story of Ivy and the parents were like, we didn't, the boy did not look like he was going to do anything like that, you know, he was fine. But you see, if you allow your children to express themselves, you're able to pick nuggets immediately and you, you know when to and when not to move. And then another thing would be, um, if your child can be confident in front of their parents, they can be confident anywhere. So you let them be, let them express themselves, let them share their, let them get angry in front of you. That way when they do something outside, you know that, you know, you know that this is my child. Sometimes things happen outside there and the reports are coming and like, oh, that's not my child, that's not my son, they cannot do it. But there are some things that you hear out there and you're like, mm, in your heart you know, yes, yes. So, you know, let the children be, let them not find expression in places you are not there. Let you not get surprise reports from other people. Uh, for me, probably, I normally do a lot of mentorship with the youths and uh, uh, parenting has really taught me a lot. But one of the things that I've done with my mentorship program that I normally do with youth is that right now we are living in a generation whereby um, everything that we want, we can get it SAP. As in, the environment has really shaped us in a way whereby um, uh, there's nothing, if probably if you want right now to order food, you just have to go to the, to the, to the Jumia app and you get food. If you want to get anything, you don't have, it's also not like those days you have to call somebody to ask them about something. The technology has really shaped us our attention span, whereby everything that we want is right there with us. So you might find that our kids are also being shaped a lot with technology. And also even us as parents, we are being shaped with technology. So the only thing that we are not getting is somebody who can just be there for us and tell us, 
Uh, just to put it in a nutshell, parenting is really key right now because we need to train our kids that to, not to be in a position whereby things are not, get, are not being given or you cannot get things that easily. You have to work for them. You have to be in a position that everything that you do, you have to work for it. That's why even corruption, the way it's in our country, that's, a, that's what is shaping us. That's what is shaping the youth, shaping our kids. Kids know that if I get into government, I'll be rich because I'll get this tender. You find a youth and when you ask him or her, what do you want to do? You tell me I want to open a company for tendering. You're thinking, and this person has just gone all the way from university. So one thing that parents should really do is really train our, train our kids, train them how to, be in a, to know that things are not just, they don't pop up like that, you have to work for them. When the kids are, are small, when they are young, a lot of parents just, they, are not, they don't have strict measures. You know, even as we let the kids be and be free and express themselves, well, there have to be some measures that we have to put in place. So those strict measures, like they know what, when to come home, how long to play, what not to do when guests are home. Uh, when I'm saying let them be, I'm not saying just let them be anyhow. Those measures, they have to be strict. And a lot of mistakes that parents do, they are not strict at that tender age. So they are not putting tight measures. Get home early, pray, sorry, pray, so play until this time. Pray for yourself, you know, do this, as in they are not being strict at that time. And then when they get to teenagers, now they are trying to be, to put the measures tight, which is supposed to be the other way around. You be strict when they are young, you grow them up with that measure. By the time they are teenagers, they already know what to do and what not to do. So that would be my advice. Let them be, but put some measures in place that they know and understand clearly. What I can say, what I really, I really learned from my, um, my spiritual parents, they really taught us a lot. It's all about communication. Communicate. Communication is the best key because I can say sometimes I can get frustrated in the office. When I come to their house, she also tries to frustrate me. But one of the things that I, I, I've really known is just never go to bed when you're angry. Always try and uh, communicate whatever it's in your heart. Just say it. Don't be in a position to hold it. Because the more you put it, you're, you're just feeling that drum. You're feeling it up. And it will come a day whereby... We're also learning on the journey. I can't say I'm in a position right now to say that we have reached. We're also learning. But one of the things that has really made us to reach where we are right now, it's communication. Communication is, is, is the best key, as I can say. Okay, for me, I'd say, well, you know, we are still young in marriage, we are still learning, and we will learn, you know, there is no, there is no degree after marriage, so it is lifetime. Um, about communication, what I really learned were three things, the what, the how, and the when. So we have tension, for example, I have to learn, I have something that I want to say, for, I want to say to him. But this word that I have to say to him, is it the right time to say it? Is, it, uh, is he angry right now as I say it? If I say it right now, how will he receive it with the tension that there is? So I had to study and learn myself. So I have something that I want to say. I will wait until I can tell the time is right to say it. And then the how, how will I say it? Will I scream? Will I communicate? You know, for example, when I know anytime he's leaving, he'd ask me to tuck his shirt in the jacket. So sorry over the jacket so i know maybe that would be the time i should tell him so as i'm doing it i'm telling her oh, babe you know yesterday what you said offended me you know it is now i have said it is the how it is the when and it is the what at the right time you know so learn to say the right thing you have the right thing but just figure out when to say it and how to say it. you know i can say something i have said it but i have offended even as i'm saying it yes i'm saying the truth but i'm giving it out in the wrong way and i'm offending at the same time and then the time is also not good. He's come from work, he's stressed, he has pressure. He'll probably not listen to me, you know. So just learn to say what you want to say, how and the when. And then the other thing we learned when we were doing our marriage counseling that we also look, we always focus on, it's a, it's a triangle. Um, so this is husband, this is wife, and then God on top. So the triangle like this. So the husband, the wife, as you strive to get close to God, and I strive to get close to God, so we are all moving towards the triangle. So 
every day we know like whether we are angry or whether we are not, whether he is sad, whether I am sad, regardless of the time, we know a specific time we have to pray. You know, so even as in our secret place, we strive to get closer to God, he's striving to get closer to God, eventually we will meet at the triangle where God is. So, and then, yeah, just speak the right words. For me, what I can say probably is that um, two things. Before um, we, I was even talking to her yesterday, I was telling her there's a difference between vision, purpose and mission, those three things. And uh, when we probably as youths, we are normally attracted to one person, let's say we normally have this peer pressure, you normally want to attract somebody because they, 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 they look nice, they are cool, uh, they are driving. She's beautiful, she, she, she just has style. We are normally attracted to things that are physical. We don't look beyond that. And um, what, what I can say is that those are the things when probably we, we, we misunderstand what's on the physical only for us to forfeit what's on the inside. For, for example, let me give an example. You get someone, yes, he's good, he's driving, he's stable, and then you start dating them. But you, you don't get that chance to understand what kind of a person is he, what kind of a person is she. Um, you, you, you don't get in a position whereby also to involve, no matter what religion part you are in, to involve God in your relationship. Because what I can say for us, it, if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't be here. Because we face the same challenges these other people are facing. But what are our values? Where do our values come from? Our values come from the Bible. Because Christ, our Christianity has really shaped us in a way whereby we know there's some things that if I do to her, um, I'll be going against uh, my values. I'll be going against the values that we have. And there's something I was reading. There's a book I'm reading. It's called the fifth, uh, the fifth learning of uh, this, the fifth discipline, where it's telling us for every serious relationship there needs to be a covenant. So I think for for the youths, we are being moved by the physical, and anything physical is subject to change. So when those changes start to happen. That's why you normally realize, okay, this is not the person that I married. So we, we, now the change comes in, probably if he was handsome or if he, she was this beautiful and now the wrinkles are starting to come out. Or some, some people normally like to pretend. They give you a certain character that you want to see. But when you get into the relationship, that's when you see the real color. I can normally tell a lady or a man, if you see somebody probably when you are dating and they are they love probably they love going out to, to party they love money or they just someone who likes probably to insult you or to beat you believe me if that person will not change while you're still dating they will never change when you're in the marriage because that's a character a three things that normally reveals character it's power money and women and those are the when you when you get into marriage those are the characters that start to reveal themselves and they make this uh, probably our relationship nowadays are not are not that strong because we are moved out things, but we are not moved. We are not. Um, we have not got above the things that we see. Yeah, I think that's what I can say on my end. Um, I think for me, I'd speak from experience, and I'd say yes, yes, very true. Character, habits, and all. If you see someone when you're dating them, and this is how they are. Don't expect any better. Just ask yourself, can I live with this? If you can't, don't go on. And then uh, another thing, when it comes to the other side, why women actually being the ones who are abused, I'd say it's insecurity. You know, someone looked at you, like the pretty face, the nice figure, the how you look, and then suddenly he's starting to feel insecure. Every other man outside there can see what I am seeing. You know, so this is available for other men. So, and then that's now when the real person comes out. He can no longer stand, it becomes insecure, uh, they start being insecure. For me, in my previous relationship, it was, uh, it was an abusive one. And so that was like the major thing, why it got abusive. 
I was I just, I had just started getting this job and then I was getting paid in dollars the money was coming in and the guy started feeling insecure he couldn't handle the fact that I was now making more than him or something like that or I'm now getting exposed to another world people can see me you know and then so the violence now started coming up but you know again I always go back to the point where before the money came before the insecurity came there were words that he'd say you know there were words like um, I cannot afford any other man to look at you. Hey, cover your legs, you know, some very, very petty things. Oh, if you keep your hair like that, so people are just looking at your pretty face, you know. Such small, small things. And then these people who are like that, who will now become violent, you can always tell by, they start distancing you from your loved ones. You know, somebody, whenever someone calls, who's that? What do they want? Why are they calling you right now? You know, so they want to distance you from your family and your close ones, people who can protect you. They put you in a cocoon where they are in charge of you and you cannot come out. You know, that's how you find somebody has been abused, they are there. Abused again, they are there. Abused, abused, and they are still there until it can no longer, it has to come out eventually. So these things do happen and they happen in secret. What we are seeing is an end, you know, but there is a means to that end. And the means are those now nitty gritty things that the person is insecure, the person is not, you know, they start feeling like they are the, they are the guys. You know, they are, and then also the environment that we are in right now, even for us women, we are being shifted. You know, we are being drifted the wrong way. The, the culture, should I call it culture? There's a word for it, I can't get it. The culture is taking us the wrong direction. People are feeling like, okay, being a feminist is the right way to go. And yes, it is good, but to an extent, it has a limit, everything has a limit. So when you try to compete with your man and he wants his place, he wants his ego massage, you're bringing out an aspect of him that is insecure, insecurity starts coming out. So I think for us it will be keep your values, know, your, know the person you're dating. If you can't date them, if you feel I can't live with this man, why is he separating me from my loved ones, why is he like this, you know, if you cannot handle what you are currently seeing, you will not handle it in future. And also for the men, what I can say is that because our, our women right now have really been empowered and everything that you are coming into, if you are coming into a relationship with a person who is driving, they have their own apartment, their kids